least right into the corner or somewhere <coughs> where you can search the business. Answer it, and you can come back in and sit that down. Um, having said that, I'm going to now call on Commissioner Mosley to give the invitation and lead us to the press release. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your Lord this morning. Father, thank you for your many blessings, Father. Father, we thank you for this early awakening, Father, with new opportunities, Father, for this day, Father. Father, we ask you, Father, to guide and direct us throughout this day, Father, we make good decisions, Father. We ask you to bless this commission board, Father. And Father, that we can make steadfast decisions, Father, that will be pleasing in your sight, Father. Father, during this time, Father, with COVID-19, Father, as the pandemic, Father, is raging across this country, Father, and other countries, Father. We ask you, Father, to have mercy on us, Father, that you, Father, allow new vaccines, Father, to be created, Father, that you bless the doctors, Father, the nurses, Father, all first responders, Father, law enforcement, Father, all medical staff, Father. Father, bless them, Father, as they are on the front lines, Father, fighting for us every day, Father. Father, as we're about to begin a new school year, Father, we would, Father, we would ask you, Father, that you bless the administrators, Father. Father, that you bless the teachers, Father, that you bless all the staff, Father. Father, as we are in an unprecedented time, Father, that you give them, Father, new ideas, Father. Father, that you help them create, Father, a conducive learning environment, Father, that you keep them safe, Father. Father, we pray for this nation, Father, this state, Father, this community, Father. Now, Father, we ask you to bless, Father, the farmers, Father, in this community, Father, as we live in a farming community, Father. And Father, we ask you, Father, to bless the employees of this great county, Father. And Father, as we move forth in this meeting, Father, we ask you to give us stability, Father. Father, that we be compassionate about others, Father. Father, as you always speak about love, Father, help us to exemplify that, Father, on a daily basis, Father, if we go about your business, Father. Father, we will be so ever kind, Father, to tell you thank you this day, Father. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. 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 Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Undivided, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Mosley. I'm going to remind all the commissioners at present time, um, and I was guilty of this, if you will make certain that your mics are on. Uh, that looks like them, they are. So, certainly. Um, Thank you for doing that. We're going to ask now Ms. Gaines to call the role of the commissioners and the staff. I am Ms. Gaines, present as clerk of the Board of Commissioners of Bullitt County. Hereby call the role for those on the governing body and ex officio staff. All those present shall answer by saying aye. Chairman Warren Thompson. Aye. Vice Chairman Anthony Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Ray Mosley. Aye. Commissioner Kurt Deal. Aye. Commissioner Timmy Rushing. Aye. Commissioner Walter Gibson. Aye. County Manager Tom Couch. Aye. County Attorney Paul and Terry Jeff Aiken. Aye. Assistant County Manager Andy Welch. Aye. Special Projects Manager Cindy Simon. Aye. County Engineer Brad Hill. Aye. Public Safety Director Ted Wynn. Aye. Public Works Director Dean Butler. Aye. Fire Chief Chris Ivey. Aye. I have determined that we have six members of the Board of Commissioners present, therefore we have a quorum to conduct business for good of the citizens of Bullock County. I now hear for the change. Ms. Gaines. Um, General agenda, before I entertain a motion to approve the general agenda, do we have any other discussion or modification desired by the county manager or the board? The county manager has no changes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if I could pass forward to say, um, I do have a, uh, a service this morning, so I may have to excuse myself at some point during the meeting. I just wanted that made for the record. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Anyone else? 
Hearing none, then I'll entertain a motion to approve the general agenda. So moved, Mr. Chairman. So, I have a motion. I have a second. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to advance. Unanimous approval. General agenda is now approved. Um, moving into new business, we have one item under the new business. It's a discussion in our action book. Contextualized marker. And I do want to say this uh, before we enter into, we do have a sign-up sheet. We will follow the sign-up sheet as you sign in. Uh, each person will have four minutes. If you're in the middle of a sentence when that buzzer goes off, you will stop and you will go back to your seat. It is my responsibility, my primary responsibility as chairman of this board to run an orderly meeting. And that is my utmost desire to do so this morning. So what I'm going to do is, as your name is called out, if you'll go to the podium over there, state your name and your address. You will direct your comments to the board. You will not be making any comments from the audience. Uh, if anything you have to say, direct them to the board. And uh, so, and having said that, if you'll call the first person, please. Jeffrey Webster. With your first word, we'll start the clock and listen for the buzzer. Jim Presley is a proud member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. I am, of course, strongly opposed to the placement of the so-called contextual marker on the courthouse grounds. The proposed marker contains the assertion that the Confederate monument was erected and memorialized, quote, faulty history. Therefore, a little history lesson is in order. Abraham Lincoln made it clear in his first inaugural address that he had no intention of interfering with slavery wherever it existed. He stated explicitly that he had no legal authority to do so. He even supported a constitutional amendment that would have guaranteed the existence of slavery in perpetuity. But he made it abundantly clear that he would use force to secure the tariff revenue collected at Southern ports. It was only after he called for 75,000 volunteers to invade the cotton states, the states of the middle and upper south, join them in secession. And this is nine out of 10 men who fought in the Confederate Army did not own slaves. The reason they fought was very simple. Their homeland was being invaded and raped by federal invaders. Our forefathers fought valiantly and fiercely against an overbearing federal government. And this, gentlemen, is why the radical left abhors Confederate monuments with such intensity. Believers in a unified central government, they wish to erase and reminder that there is a breed of people who will stand up against the tyrannical depredations of a federal government that has stepped outside its constitutional bounds. Furthermore, we need to consider the implications of setting a precedent for contextual markers. For example, should we place a contextual marker at the Martin Luther King Monument in Atlanta, explaining that he allowed the Civil Rights Movement to be co-opted by members of the Communist Party, or that had he lived, he would have been stripped of the title of doctor when it came to light that he plagiarized his doctoral thesis. I personally would be opposed to such contextualizing. But once his president is set, be ready. Finally, the proposed marker would require an exception to an existing county ordinance. This exception is sought, quote, in light of the recent extraordinary events in our nation regarding race relations. In other words, you propose giving in to rioters and looters. My friends, I ask you to consider this, that if you give in now, you only encourage the lawlessness plaguing our nation and invite the rioters and looters to come to our fair city. On June the 6th, we witnessed the vulgarity and calls for violence at the Black Lives Matter slash Antifa rally at the county courthouse. That gives just a presentment of things to come if you give in now. All right. Please, commissioners, please reject this resolution. It serves no good purpose and will lead to bad, possibly violent consequences. Thank you very much. Michael Moore. My name is Michael Mall, I'm the commander of the 
you can watch this count, 941 signs from Deborah Duff. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and the county office staff, I rise to speak in um, opposition to the adoption of this resolution. My reason is simple. The proposed wording for the marker is conjecture and opinion and not proven or established facts. The inscription on the south face of the monument back to side facing some other bank reads, Conrad, in memory of the Confederate soldier, 1861 to 1865. That's the concept of the monument, and it needs no further definition. I've read the checks and speech given on that April day back in 1909 when the monument was unveiled and dedicated. Nowhere, I repeat, nowhere in those remarks were the words slave or slavery or anything referring to that institution were mentioned. I further object to the approval of this resolution on the grounds that it discriminates against the Geeky Rifles Camp 941. Two years ago, a camp member and I met with Chairman Thompson and the county manager to discuss the placement of a flag similar to the ones on the northwest corner of the courthouse. We were then informed of the existence of a policy adopted on April 18, 2017 stipulating that after that date, no monument signs or structures of a permanent nature could be placed on the courthouse grounds. We understood that policy applied across the board and the signs of Confederate veterans were not singled out. Now this commission is being asked to change the rules in the middle of the game. That, ladies and gentlemen, is wrong and unfair. We only ask that we be treated in an equitable fashion. If this commission is determined to pass this resolution, giving preferential and discriminating treatment for the Willow Hill Heritage and Limitbox Center, the Obiki White asked for the resolution to be amended, giving us the right to place our own marker of similar size and design adjacent to the one erected by the Senate. We have a copy of the text that we would like to put on this monument. Matt, could you distribute that to the members of the board? That's my remark. Gentlemen, do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Paul.
I mean, how many people here knows that uh, Abraham Lincoln shipped slaves out of the country before the war started? Does anybody know that? I mean, things like that, that, that our students are not teaching the history like it was. All that's being left out of the books today. And people need to go back and, and read and dig out and find out the truth about what actually went on. And you look at the difference in, in you talk about slavery and how bad it was. Yeah, it was bad, and I'm not for slavery at all. I don't think it should exist anywhere, anywhere, but it's still in this world today. And it's been here, I guess, since the world started. But, if, make a point here, if it was, if it was so terrible, when the war was over, why did all the slaves just take, pick up the leave? They didn't do that. The majority of them stayed right where they were. Now, I'll admit, there were slave owners who were terrible people. They were bad. But the majority of them were good people. Because you don't destroy what's making a living for you. You take care of it. And that'll be what was going on. So there's a, a list on there of people not understanding what, what actually went on. But the bottom line is, people just need, they need to learn their history. And they need to get out and, and instead of sitting around home, you go find a job and make good for yourself. Because there's plenty of people around you know, and, and everybody denigrates the black people because, oh, they won't work, they won't work. Well, they will. I know plenty of black people that are going to find a job and, and they're good people. I mean, they're general people. But you just... I don't know, it just frustrates me what's going on. But we don't need to be if you don't put a sign next to the thing down there, let it speak the truth. Find out what the truth is. That's what we got getting having thrown at us every day now in the news media and the newspapers. It's not the truth. It ain't what's going on. You need to look at what's behind what's going on now. Look at who's funding the money, where it's coming from. And that's been going on for a long time. We got a group of super rich people in this world who's trying to run, they want the whole world. And they're getting it. They're working at it. They're coming close to getting it. So that's what we need to be looking at instead of these trivial things. Thank you. Dennis Weedon. And uh, I'm concerned to the system about my southern heritage. When I first heard that there was a request for a contextual marker by the Board of Human Heritage in the Lincoln Center to be placed under the Confederate monument on the Board of County Courthouse Square, I thought that this is a great idea. It would help provide a means for other voices to be heard and for other cultures to be respected, in particular the African American culture in Board County. So with great interest, I will propose more than one of the Dependence 
cartels against northern aggression a certain animosity against confederate soldiers who were diseased and wounded and killed whose homes were burned and pillaged as they fall in distant states away from their families a certain animosity against white mothers and children who had to work hard in the field all day in order to survive having no husbands around to protect or support them during those harsh years these are the ones this contextual marker fails to recognize and the ones it clearly offends we must note that during this time six percent of white families in the state owned no slaves and nearly six percent of white georgians held nearly half the state's property and land and slaves the number of landless whites increased over the end of the long period and made up nearly half of the white province by 1860 many of these were farm tenants who made up as much as 40 percent of the agricultural workforce in some of the state's most marginalized counties as a civilian local county in 1849 george white wrote statistics of the state of georgia the county is inhabited by an industrious and kind people although the lands which most of the citizens cultivate are poor yet yet by dint of industry and economy they managed to supply their wants which however are very few many rely in a great degree upon the game with which which the county amounts and the production of their orchards the royal county farmer would get rich while others would starve as a reading white survey it sounded like both county had a lot of good families hard working citizens living here not long before the war the majority of our southern soldiers were not slave owners and weren't fighting to protect slavery they were fighting because their country was being invaded by a deadly army from the north yes there was slavery here as a test was it was but there was also a lot of good happening here a lot of good people and reading the contextual marker under proposal one would never think so michael baxter shop shared at the secession of the state of virginia Benjamin W. Jones found that the determination to resist invasion, the first and most sacred duty of the free people, and the general, if we get in person. Mr. Wiggins, your time is now up. We certainly appreciate your presentation. Okay. Sorry. Sherry Barr. I'm sorry, I signed in as attending. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ms. James. George Fletcher. Also, I was born in New Jersey, but I spent most of my life down south between Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia, with the majority of time in Georgia between Georgia Tech and Statesboro. So yes, I'm a damn Yankee. I tend to develop a connection and sense of pride in the areas in which I live. That sense incorporates the people, restaurants, businesses, and activities, as well as the history. It is my opinion that the Union women in the Civil War preserved the United States as one strong country of freedom versus a splintered one with many parts and unknown personal liberties. People of many cultures and ethnic backgrounds died for both sides during the Civil War. The basis for the Confederacy deciding to secede and fight for their beliefs of state rights, equitable commercial considerations, and pride should not be considered a lost cause or white supremacy as suggested by the proposed text of the contextual marker, but rather a sense of freedom and self-determination. To suggest otherwise is an acknowledgement of current rhetoric and attempt at revisionist history. All history of the United States is not pleasant or fair, but it is the history. The proposed text is inflammatory, disrespectful, and inappropriate, as well as out of context. To approve the proposal would be a step in the wrong direction. Regardless of the decision of the Board of Commissioners on this current issue, I'll abide by it due to the defined process being followed to arrive at a decision. I truly hope that others will do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alvin Jackson.
ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Alvin Jackson, a physician by training and board president of the World Hill Heritage and Renaissance Center, which is an African American museum and community center. World Hill was founded in 1874 as one of the first schools for African Americans in Bullock County. My lineage traced back to way beyond the days of slavery. When you hear the name of Hodges, Donaldson, Little, Lee, Parrish, Hall, Brandon, Riggs, Nevels, Lanier, these were all Confederates and former slave owners who owned my ancestors, and thus we bear their name. And if we look a little deeper, deeper by the genetics, some of the same blood that flows through me flows through other members of the community who are of the Caucasian persuasion. In August 1619, the twin slave Africans were brought to Fort Comfort in the English colony of Virginia. This site is now part of Fort Monroe National Monument. It represents uh, from 1619 to 2019 one of the years of African American history. So the current president and the Congress established a 15 minute commission to uh, honor the 40 years of African American heritage in these United States. In response to this charge, on the commission, the Royal Paris Amazon Center organized a community forum in January. Uh, 19, January 26, 2019, where approximately 40 community members came, and at that meeting we established four major committees. One, the establishment of a memorial committee um, to honor the contributions of enslaved African Americans and other African American Bullock County, to establish the Dr. Martin Luther King um, or a program contest for which we have participated with the Bullock County School, school System to um, preserve uh, African American cemeteries, for which we have a series called If These Cemeteries Can Talk, All the Stories They Can Tell, and to re establish the World of Month Reunion. All of us today are honoring the legacy of John Lewis, a great soldier who fought long and hard for the valor of all people, both white and white, to be citizens of the United States. We will all recognize that America is one of the greatest countries in the world, but we must also agree that the basis of the country was founded on white supremacy and white superiority. So we must at some point have this conversation, though painful it may be, to deal with issues of our past as it relates to our future. How did we all get to where we are now? How are we having this discussion where someone's saying, oh, this is good, this is not good. How do we get here? Well, the United Southern States seceded from the Union to form the Confederate States. Dr. Jackson, I'm very sorry, but four minutes has passed. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? That no one else has signed up, so I'm going to now place it in the hands of the commissioners. Uh, I, I suppose you have three choices. If you've heard something that you want to uh, think about more, then this decision could be deferred to a later date, or it could be voted no, it could be voted down, or it could be voted yes, which could be to a last. So, um, going to now ask the commissioner, are there any discussion from any of the Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that uh, I understand both sides. I appreciate everybody coming. I'm a new commissioner sitting in this seat. 
everybody knows we got several several groups that uh, I'm not I'm not gonna try to name all of them. I'll use two of them. The best ones I can think of that Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. There's not so much room up there on that county courthouse. Or it's called the Delta Park and we have functions up there. I understand it's getting around some things up there not. With that being said, there was a policy put in place by this board of commissioners. And I think that everyone is sitting here other than Mr. Stringer. He's absent today, but I think every other commissioner up here voted for that policy. Except for me. I did not hold this seat at that time. So I understand, but just like we all see in this room, if we change, then it's gonna be every meeting. There's gonna be somebody else, somebody wants something, somebody doing something. So with that being said, I'm gonna make a motion to uphold the policy that was put forward by this commission that no side will be a taken. It's just a policy and if we're gonna change it, I mean they don't mean to do away with it because it just it's need to have it. Uh, that's the motion I'd like to put forward the minister to uphold the policy that was put in place by this commission and this county vote. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Rushing, you've heard the motion set forth. Are all those in favor of the motion, show of hands. I'm sorry, a second. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, any more discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, show of hands. All those opposed. Okay. The motion to deny will is approved. So um, at present time then the marker is not allowed to go on the courthouse square right there. Uh, we certainly appreciate um, everybody coming this morning and we're going to take a, we've got a lot more business. We're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to reconvene in here you know, at nine, well, let's say 915. That'll be about a 10 minute break. And you're certainly welcome to stay around if you would like to do so. And if not, uh, this would be a good time to leave. Thank you all for coming.
it's a pleasure to come to you this morning. Uh, Chief Ida and I are going to update you on a number of things this morning, but I wanted to open the conversation and give you uh, an update on where we're at with the Center for Public Safety Management, who is doing uh, a thorough study of EMS and fire services. And uh, it has been challenging, to say the least, with COVID because their staff is spread over several states. So staff members are operating under different parameters. But um, we are now into the operational portion of that study. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Joe Pozo, who is the public safety, uh, excuse me, the public protection chief in Volusia County, Florida, is taking over the project at this point in time. And as COVID will allow, he anticipates a visit up here to sit down with management, perhaps some commissioners, uh, the chief and myself, and, uh, and get that operational side of the study done. The data is in, they've analyzed the EMS call
Mr. Fogo with GBSM, uh, about a week ago, sent us a series of questions that we need to answer on the EMS side and on the fire side. And the fire questions were about 48, and EMS only had about 20 something. And one of the things that they're going to be looking at, uh, because Joe and I talked about that specifically, is is it possible, does it make sense in the county if we combine the resources, the boots on the ground, uh, per se, of EMS and fire, so we can benefit uh, from the manpower from both and perhaps strengthen those uh, even more uh, going forward into the future. As I said before, we're not going to turn paramedics and EMTs into firefighters, but there are things that they can do on the fire ground. Uh, they go to structure fires anyway. There are things that they can do on the fire ground that perhaps we can get credit uh, with ISO towards that. So, uh, CPS is going to be looking at that too. So, do you have any questions for us? Yes, sir. I do have one question. Um, first of all, do you commissioners have a question? How long is before you think this whole process may be finished? Um, the guy from Florida and anything else we have to do here? I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping early fall that we can have this project done. We're well into July right now. As I said, he does plan to make a trip up here. Uh, he has extensive experience in EMS and fire operations. And um, I know that because he went to work for CPSM full time, but Volusia County asked him to come back. And he said he would only if he could continue to consult with CPSM. So he's got a great deal of expertise. He wants to get on the project and uh, we're, we're supplying them with everything that they need for that process to move forward. I think some of that will be driven by COVID-19. Um, I don't know what his company's policy is. I don't know uh, with regard to this. I don't know what face-to-face -face meetings they're allowed. We certainly could do things via Zoom, but uh, he wants to come here because he wants to look at the county and he wants to talk to some people face-to-face. -face. So hopefully we can make that happen. Thank you very much. This is Kevin Ross Murray. I have a question that uh, I was wondering the combat that uh, in the face of this uh, encounter that was put up in the court area uh, was quite educational. I thought many times um, why they were putting it up and actually had a chance to speak with the person that was putting it up to understand better how the child was operated without pressing the business on the before. So that was. That was very educational for me to, to see the report actually and for them to explain to me what they were doing. That radio system was a joint city county, joint city county project that we all did together. And it took some time. And it was not without frustration, but what we have ended up with is a great product that um, as I said before, this is the last radio system I'm gonna buy. I think yeah. you said that before the last two, haven't you? <laughs> Well, I think it, it, it'll help with the ISO rating, too. If I recall, during our last rating for PTC, you know, we have a pretty robust 911 system and a radio system, and I think we scored highly on both, but I think if they could get extra credit points for public safety communication, we'd probably get it with ISO. We, we have a very, very good countywide system right now as far as the public safety communication. Any other commissioners questions? I do have one, and this is Chief Ivy. How many people have we interviewed as far as having a full time fireman's job? Mm. They So we're not having an abundance of people then that really, uh, I guess, are interested in being firefighters. Yeah, no, we're, the pay is great, the benefits that goes on with it's great. 
there's just uh, a lot of them that I talk to by phone that's nervous about leaving a uh, tight knit family with working with three others or six others to leave that and come and work by themselves. Um, we have had four that's left their close knit family and couldn't work um, by themselves and say they won't go back. So it's, it's just uh, that nervousness of taking that step. Um, yeah, I have a question for the chief, just if you don't mind, sir, and maybe it'll provide clarity. Uh, assuming we were to get the safer grant uh, and we were fully staffed with 18, uh, would that resolve some of the issue of kind of being alone at a station? Would, would that, would the staffing allow the opportunity to have two at every station on a shift? Yes, sir. And maybe that would make a difference? In that? Yeah, it would. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I, I guess uh, I consider it an ideal, an ideal opportunity if there's someone that wants a job because we have jobs to offer. And what I'll consider a good salary, like you said, and also um, probably some of the best benefits around. And, and I can understand, could part of this be the facilities that we have, or is it basically they don't want to leave to like you just said, they don't want to leave their home home base where I guess they work with other departments. That's right. Um, we uh, we renovated uh, Section Two in Fool. Um, Section Seven in Brooklyn was renovated years back when EMS moved down there full time. But we've also um, done some renovations to Section Three and Register and Section Five and Base. Um, so new appliances, new paint, new flooring. The, the whole nine yards, so it's not the, definitely not the living quarters or everything. From what I'm understanding, we're eventually we'll have 18, we have six now in each way, right? If the safer is approved. If, if the safer is approved, safer. we'll have 18, yes, sir. Okay. But if not, then we're 20. 10 for 12. Yes. Okay. And we could hire those 12 today if they came in and qualified to for the job? Yes, sir. And as, as time plays out, listening to uh, what the consultant has to say, we may end up having to uh, train them in house. Somebody that's non certified. It's, uh, it's a little bit challenging, it can be done. Um, it's a roughly an eight week class minimum, so they might spend a week or six weeks and realize that it's not what they all it's worth but it, that's an option that we we're looking pretty closely at of maybe having to do a in-house training okay. and mr thomas i'll make one more point we i hesitate to say where we may put the firefighters because the consultant is going to drive that decision based on data where the calls are when the calls are occurring and uh like i said the register stations is, is an extremely busy station. They run a lot of calls, so that may be a station that ends up being a man station uh, uh, eventually, but we won't know until they, the data is gonna drive that decision. Any other questions? How many technical groups are we looking at? How many do we have? We, uh, Currently, currently, we have, we have currently we have four. Um, if you look at statistics, I think we're going to be three to four short. But that's where both consultants that we're working with is going to help us nail down exactly how many we need before we just guess. And I'm assuming they'd be placed around the county. Is that correct? That's correct. Chief, under the ideal situation, we have everything in place, which is the 12 firefighters. 18 would be a plus, but let's just go on 12. When, when do you think that the ISO, um, when will insurance premiums, when will ISO, how long will it take them to come up with their evaluation and when do you think that the um, lower 
issue with all that. But since that's finished, is there anything more to talk about that? Or, or we're going to hand this out to Ray. I think you got one in Brooklyn, haven't you? We do. Uh, uh, yes, there's, there's continuing to be talk about that. And I think that the best thing we can do is wait on the final study from, from CPSM to derive that decision because that's going to be driven based on data, not on emotions or people just saying they need an ambulance. There. It's going to be driven by call frequency and where the calls are happening at, which is, which is the way you've got to make those decisions because they are hard decisions. If it was a hard decision to go to Brooklyn, it's not for us when we made that decision. But we, we made that decision based on where the calls were occurring. Um, occurring at that time, and the size of the, the portion of the county that that station would be would be covering. So it's not it's like any community. It's, it, it's driven by call volume and, and uh, you know the data that, that we need to make those decisions. On the fire truck equipment and or the fire trucks, um, CBS is going to analyze every vehicle that we've got, and they may very well come back and say you don't need that anymore. You know, it's 20 years old, take it out of service. And they're going to give us a, a, a schedule of over the next five to 10 years of what we will need to buy on an annual or a biannual basis to achieve the goals that we believe that they're going to help us identify through this study. So I'm excited to, to have the study coming back because I, I think it's going to take Bullock County and public safety a long way into the future. Really do. And I wanted to, uh, while I had the podium, give a, a special thanks and shout out to our EMS personnel who are working under very difficult circumstances right now. Most every call they're having to wear PPE equipment to protect themselves. 911 is doing a great job of analyzing these calls as they come in and advising EMS, but, and public health is helping us identify COVID cases in the community. So we can actually be prepared before they get there. But I do want to just be very complimentary of, of the difficult time that they have right now of being in these calls. Sheriff's Department too, Police Department. It's, it's a tough time to be in public safety right now because you don't know what you may be carrying home to your family. So we need to be in prayer for all those out there running those calls. Have you said that? Um, because I know we certainly do not ask for names, but has EMS and the Sheriff's Department been hit hard by positive tests? No, very, very fortunate. Uh, I think our community, led by you and the mayor, we, we got out real early uh, with regards to distancing, and we, under your leadership, we were to get out real early under social distancing and mask and protection. So we, we started early with EMS. Now we've had some sickness and there have been some positive cases, but um, but not anywhere like I've heard in other communities that have had to deal with this that have just decimated departments. Um, because 14 days is a long time to take an ambulance shift out of business. If you take a whole shift out of business, you've got a lot of backfilling to do and a lot of people going to be working a lot of overtime. So. Not going well, we've been very blessed so far. Wouldn't you say that? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Well, and, and my last statement would be, because I read all the reports, is over 700 positive tests. That's and correct. We're, we're over, over 800 now. Over 800 now. Yeah. Right. Over 800. And, and uh, but the good thing is we've only had seven deaths. That's the good thing. Because, I mean, it's bad. I mean, nobody wants to read about somebody passing away, but I noticed that the last two days, not today, but, you know, we've been, we had 24 tests positive, 24, I think that was Monday, Tuesday, um, no, that was Saturday, Sunday, and now we're down to 12 each day, so it looks like we, hopefully, we are decreasing, um, <coughs> but I, we don't know what today will hold or tomorrow will hold, but what pleases me the most is, I see a lot of negative comments about wearing a mask. But what pleased me this morning was everybody in this room had on a mask, everybody I saw in the hall had on a mask. <coughs> and so people are taking it serious. But I do know that there are people out there with medical problems that possibly cannot wear a mask. So having said that, with this particular update, is anyone else have a statement? How is, Mr. Woman, how is the census numbers and new reports, I don't think you finished yet, is that gonna have any bearing on this study? 
the, the census. You know, uh, I better Mr. Couch talk to speak to that. I'm not sure how to address that one. I think it's a little too early to say. Um, you know, the census response rates statewide in Georgia have been notoriously low, and particularly low here in the county, although it seems to be concentrated in Statesboro and Portal. But in recent discussions I've had with some other community leaders, we're particularly if and when the students come back. Uh, we know, for example, at Georgia Southern University, you know, the people who live on campus, they can be accounted for in what I think is formally called group quarters. But um, the challenge will be trying to enumerate the people, or, or rather the students, who live off campus. Um, you all may know that our plane was, was increasing. We, you know, last year's estimate was uh, just short of 80,000 people. Uh, will it be that way when the official census uh, the numbers are revealed a couple years from now? I don't know, but I think everybody will have an asterisk by their population figure uh, due to COVID-19. But I think uh, once the pandemic would pass, uh, we'd probably resume our, north, our, our normal growth rate. And, um, you know, I would think we're just going to keep growing by on average 1,200 people a year, is that what it turns out to be? So if things can come back to normal, I think we'll be okay, but there, there is a possibility that the, that the numbers may be skewed. Well, as they always say, you know, more people, more services. Well, when things resume to normal, we're gonna continue that trajectory. I'll make one more plug for masks. Uh, I agree with the CDC, it's a, it's a minor inconvenience, but I think if we can endure for a period of time, four, six, eight weeks, we can really uh, squash the spread. And Ms. Barr, she's working so hard uh, helping us distribute masks in the community, and, and um, I'm thankful that for that partnership that we've had with the city. Uh, we've been able to distribute uh, close to 60,000. They have left our trailer, and we may have some in possession, but. We've only got about 15,000 left of the original 81,000 that we got. And we've got some more coming thanks to you and the mayor. So thank you. Thank you for this report. Uh, and, uh, we will now ask Mr. Butler to come up, our public work director, and give an <laughs> update on this particular uh, hour of the recycling celebration. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, to brief you on our work conditions or statuses for uh, public works, basically solid waste, I think is what you get inquired about. Um, the, as we know, we're moving forward with our plan that we had kind of developed I guess around the first of the year, we had talked about reorganizing and restructuring the, the solid waste services. And in that, uh, 16 of the centers now have electric gates operational. Got a little bit of some ups and downs with that on programming, and when we lose power in a certain area, it does affect those gates opening and closing. And we usually have to, once we get notification of that, we have to go back and readjust those timers. Um, there's the camera installations are in progress. They started last week with pulling wire and getting everything set up to install the cameras for observations on those centers. We've, uh, we've modified the centers a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, um, with how we're servicing them and uh, with the new equipment, the, the grapple truck and uh, so we've kind of set it up to where the small containers stay in place uh, for the public to use. We go by each center during the day and uh, if not multiple times per day with a gravel truck, we move all of the waste from small containers to one large container, and uh, which cuts down on the number of trips that we have to make to service centers. And we cut that down dramatically lately. Uh, so we're, we're making some good progress towards managing the centers. 
Uh, we're reorganizing some signage and uh, getting some information out about that. And basically all 19 centers uh, will go from 6.30 to 7 o'clock. We will post those and we will readjust the, the website accordingly. Uh, but I didn't see a reason since we're not manning centers and we're not talking about some of them staying open later than others or whatever. Let's just put them all in the same cycle. And uh, so we'll, we'll run them all 12 and a half hours a day. Uh, there will be a few centers that will still remain closed on Thursdays to help us get caught up and in going into the weekend. Um, so one of the main things, and, and you've heard it over and over, and I don't want to be a head horse with COVID, uh, but between the, the COVID issue and, and uh, annual leave, we faced uh, some issues with labor um, in both transportation and solid waste. And what we have come to the conclusion of is, unless there's an objection from y'all, we are prioritizing solid waste to service the collection centers, uh, even at the expense of maybe less service in transportation. Uh, last week, we moved some people from other greater operations to truck drivers just to try to keep up with the service on the centers, getting the centers cleaned out. And that's the environmental sanitation issues with the centers. Uh, we feel like that should be our priority is servicing those centers at this point. Luckily, hopefully that's wood. Uh, we've not experienced any dramatic weather issues that are going to take us on the roads right now. So we're, uh, we're working in that way uh, and, and prioritizing our work accordingly. Uh, you have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Also, one other issue, uh, and Commissioner Strainer was the one that was, uh, I guess, questioning me a good bit on this, was our oil collections, uh, recyclable oil, used oil at the centers. We've had several, not all centers have an oil collection point, but some of them did. Those uh, collection points are not, um, they don't meet standards for the EPD uh, collection. Uh, so we're trying to work our way out of that. We will be placing some signage on that as well, that we're no longer accepting used oil, but we will be giving them references to where they can possibly dispose of that, which is mostly any uh, auto parts place uh, generally accepts used oil. So they can take their, when they buy the oil, change their oil, they can take their oil back there. And uh, so we're, we're gonna be giving that information out with the signage. Uh, when we discontinue those and, and get those collected and clean those areas up so we don't have any environmental issues from that. Any questions? Did we hear something about the possibility of some recycling beginning again? At this point, uh, I think we're probably stagnant on, on recycling. Um, there's not a market. There's nowhere to dispose of it, any type, really. Uh, other than metal, and we are continuing to collect metal and uh, process that through recycling. But for the most part, uh, if, if someone wants to do home recycling, they can put their cans that they may have that can go in our metal container and not just standard garbage if they're willing to do that. Um, but paper, cardboard, glass, the market is just pretty much dead right now. So there's just no, we don't have an outlet for it. Um, so we just, it's not something that, that we can, uh, that we have storage capabilities to collect it and store it until such time as if it possibly does come back in the future. So at this point, we just continue to do anything else besides metal. So part of the problem with the glass is when we don't have the center staff, it gets contaminated. So even though you've got a market for clean glass, the glass is getting contaminated with garbage so that you can't really sell it because there's nobody there staffing the center. Is that correct? The glass, the glass issue and contamination is basically the separation of colored glass. There's three different color variations on glass. The only glass that really has any value is clear glass. Uh, everything else was secondary to that. And once you contaminate your clear glass with colored glass, then it becomes no value at all. Basically, you, it costs you to get rid of it at that point. Uh, so, so basically, we sent home all the older workers, 
since that point the center's not on the work staff and there's no plans at this point to cross train or bring anybody else in to staff them? The, the glass collection, even when we had center attendance, was being contaminated. There was no way to for them to regulate that on a consistent basis. It's not to say they didn't try, but there was no consistency in us being able to regulate somebody pulling up a colored brown glass and clear glass container collection point. And uh, so that was that's something we battled for a long time, and uh, even with attendance. But because of recycling uh, programs and, and the market issues and uh, concerns budget-wise moving forward, that was what drove the uh, deciding factor for discontinuing the attendance use at this point in the centers. We're going to cameras, we're going to electric gates. Um, hopefully we can monitor by camera any violations and, and help us uh, even monitor the centers as far as the need to be serviced uh, from a remote location and then we can cut down on our travel expenses and uh, manage that a little bit more accordingly hopefully pick it up with some code enforcement on possible violations thank you yes ma'am commissioners anything else what about time program you still getting able to get rid of those on here Get rid of what? The tires. Tires? Old tires, yeah. Yes, sir. We're the, and that's just being processed through the uh, transfer station. We pick those up. We carry them to the transfer station. It is a, a considerable expense on us to dispose of tires that way. Uh, I think we're paying $75 a ton to get rid of tires. Uh, so it's, uh, it's considerable, but we're still doing it, yes. We don't bury none of them, do we? No, sir. <laughs> I didn't think so. No, sir. I didn't think so. <laughs> no. That would, uh, that would be an EPD violation. <laughs> we certainly appreciate the update. Thank you. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Going to now move into staff comments. Gibson had asked me to give an update on the Cypress Lake and the bypass intersection project and just give you all a quick update. Um, Georgia DOT did send us our permit a couple weeks ago and Parker Engineering who did the design for the project is finalizing the bid documents. It's about a 240 page uh, document but it should be ready to go out and bid uh, in about a week and so it's going to be advertised for about a month and so in early September I should be bringing you all a little bit uh, for that project and we'll be moving forward with it during the fall. Uh, anyone have any questions on that? People apparently have a lot of interest in that thing they call all the time. So I appreciate you doing that. We should be seeing some activity uh, in the fall like I said. I think we'll be running a bid back in September and then we can move forward with it. Good, quicker than that. They have renamed it the mm -hmm. uh, racetrack, right? Let's not do that. I thought they already had.
ready? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Commissioner Rushing, this could be a little painful when you get our hand with me, okay? I, I know it won't take you with just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but what I am talking about is, is important. Um, I think over the past month, I've indicated that uh, we're expected to, to get some federal stimulus money through the CARES Act. Um, and within the act, it's called the Coronavirus, a coronavirus Relief Fund for state, local, territorial, and tribal governments. And what I want to do is sort of explain where we think we're going to go with it, how we may be able to use the funds, but I do have to tell you, even though that we've gotten letters and notifications of allotments of these funds, and I'll explain it again in a minute, but the state has not yet set up the portal for the funding. Uh, but I'm just gonna walk through what it is, kind of explain how much I believe we're going to get based on our calculations, some of the guidance that we re reviewed on how we can spend it and, uh, and the timelines and other provisions uh, that we have to spend it uh, under. And finally, uh, we think we wanna put out a preliminary plan of what we recommend, where to put the funds. And when we put the fiscal 21 budget together, you might have heard me uh, refer to it as a rolling budget, which is uh, maybe a monitor for saying that we have to be nimble and we may have to change uh, allocations and priorities from time to time. But uh, I think after I go through this, maybe it'll give you a better understanding of what we're gonna do. So um, $150 billion was set, up, set aside for state, local, territorial, and tribal governments. And uh, ultimately, there's strings attached, of course, and there's rules to play, play the game with it. But the fund can only be used to cover expenses that are what the guidance calls necessary and incurred between March 1st of 2020 and December 30th of 2020, which means, you know, there's, once the funds do become available, there is a reimbursement element that goes, goes back to March 1st. But the funds technically have to go uh, to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And also it can't be, uh, you can't use the funds if they were already uh, accounted for in the budget, most recently approved March 27, 2020. We don't have a problem with that. We did make, uh, I think, a year-end budget amendment, but we did make a budget amendment that really uh, anticipated the impact of COVID-19 by that time, so I think we're safe there. And as you recall, when we passed the fiscal 21 budget, uh, we assumed at the time, well, we couldn't make any assumptions really that we were gonna get any of this CARES money because we just didn't know. So I think we're safe uh, in, in, in that element too. Uh, it has some special provisions. There's an inspector general of the, along with the treasury department that's going to provide oversight for the program. He's the big bad dude for money cut and uh, it's their job to ensure, and there's gonna be one, more than one inspector general, I'm sure they'll be all over the place, but uh, as the reporting goes back uphill, as I like to say, uh, inspector generals are going to be there to make sure that uh, none of us as local governments or state governments or tribes or territories have uh, tripped over a wire. Again, we have to obligate these funds by December 30th, so when you look at the allocations that, we, um, that we've been awarded or that are eligible for reimbursement, technically, if we started today, we have to spend about $300,000 a week on average before the end of the year to fully utilize those funds. Again, there's a variety of uh, federal guidelines. We haven't heard the state chime anything in about guidelines, but they can't do anything more than what the Treasury Department requires. 
they can't be more restrictive. So, um, you know, we've been trained, as I'll explain, to follow uh, guidance that has been given by the Treasury uh, to other states and local governments. So I think we feel pretty secure that the plan that we're forming is going to follow all the federal and ultimately the state rules. Now, um, it's tricky in this way because it's, the guidance says you can't use funds to directly account for revenue shortfalls due to COVID-19, but you may indirectly use the funds uh, to assist with revenue shortfalls in cases where expenses paid for by the fund would otherwise widen the gap between revenues and expenditures. And this is a mathematical example. I can't say it's 100% true yet on the expense side, but um, given the current wave, uh, it's very likely that we, we could get up to $9 million uh, in expenses. But we, we hope we'll kind of break even on this. But if, if you use this mathematical formula, if the county is eligible to get 7.6 million in CRF, our county revenues, I think, uh, have probably dropped by 2 million. We expect to have about $9 million in expenses during the period. And if you do that little formula down below, it shrinks the fiscal gap by about 3.4 million. But we feel like we may have an opportunity by using uh, the Treasury guidance to maybe bring that gap as close to zero as possible and improve, well, I won't say improve, I'll say buoy our, our financial position. Because if you know, when we, we were putting the budget together, we were worried about last year's fiscal uh, deficit and this year's claim deficit. So, Approximately 75% of our estimated costs for, re, uh, for reimbursement are probably going to involve covering payroll expenses and cash asset purchases, which will be about $6 million doing, during the period. And provided that COVID-19 doesn't extend in, uh, into calendar year 2021 or doesn't extend intensively because we don't know if there's going to be a second round of this for state and local governments. Uh, it, does, it does, like I say, create an opportunity to help us plug our fis fiscal gap and cash concerns. But in the plan that, that we're presenting, it also allows an opportunity to provide some, I think, uh, desperately needed community aid. So when Georgia got its allocation back in March, I think, maybe early April, they were allotted $4.1 billion. And the state share came out to be a little under $3 million because the big metro counties, Cobb, Gwinnett, DeKalb, and Fulton, got a direct allocation of $614 million. So what that left was approximately $1.23 billion for all the other small to mid-sized or mid-sized local governments to, to share a population distribution. And uh, our, I'll be showing our unincorporated share in a minute, although I've already revealed it, potentially up to 7.6 million. But there's gonna be three phase, phases of funding. And the first phase has been allocated, but like I said, the portal hasn't been set up. We haven't received our advance money yet. And, um, you know, the sand is, is really running out of the glass every day between now and December 30th. So that's what the, these are what the allocations look like countywide. If everybody were to draw down their money, we would get uh, approximately 7.6 million. Brooklyn would get 316,000, quarter 120, um, registered about 33, and Statesboro about 5.7 million. And then as you go across the table, you see phase one, you know, we can, we, the money that's supposed to be dropping in the back bank any day as I hear it, is a little under 700,000, but when you add the reimbursement allotment, it's about 2.3 million for the first round, and then uh, nearly 2.7 in the subsequent rounds or phases 
but we don't know exactly yet when uh, when we're going to be, uh, be able to pull that money. But we are working on a cash flow plan, and it's funny if you put it on a chart, it's like a big zigzag. But at the end, you know, we should be coming back up. And I won't go through all of this, although um, what's in the red uh, sort of illustrates many of the kinds of expenditures that, that we're trying to target it for, but you you can pay for COVID-19 related medical expenses, public health, payroll expenses for public safety and public health, actions to facilitate compliance with public health measures, with, which this is a, a fancy way of helping us provide supplies, PPE, make building accommodations, buy hardware, software, communications, even pays for some of our auditing, because we'll be subject to the single audit act uh, by, the end of, uh, by the end of the calendar year. We'll try to go forward uh, reimbursement. Well, no, actually backward, we could go March 1st to uh, June 30th. But a lot of the things that we want to try to do with this block of money is is to try to either buy as many touch thing, uh, touch free things as possible. We we want to be able to uh, buy all the supplies and the PPE that we need to provide to employees as well as the public. Uh, we want to do some um, uh, do some things that with hardware and software that may hopefully reduce the number of people who are coming into, uh, into some of our buildings or uh, public facilities. I think you've heard me say in the past, in normal times, three to 5,000 people a week, duplicated or unduplicated, maybe coming through our buildings, especially here in town. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, public health measures that we can take to make our facilities safer for both employers and employees. And going back to community aid, they can provide economic support, food security, uh, housing security, possibly business support, more likely nonprofit support. I'll talk about that in a minute. We're, we're a little squishy on doing business support because it's a lot more complicated to, to provide. And you gotta get it out fast and there's a lot of screening and qualifying that has to be done. And then this, this is just a list of ineligible expend, expenditures, but uh, none of them are applicable to the plan that we're trying to put together. And in the interest of time, I'm kind of skipping through this, but I can email this to you subsequently, it'll be in a document. Now, there are several elements, strategic elements that we took into consideration when we were trying to put this plan together, and I'll just kind of go through each of these individually and quickly. We did a lot of research. Um, I think between Andy and myself, and I don't know if this is a conservative figure, but we, we studied CARES plan budgets of, uh, I would guess, at least 30 different local governments nationwide trying to get a grab on what they were spending their money on, because a lot of local governments, you see Georgia's very behind in the game on this. There were several other states but with local governments who are similarly situated like us who got their money much earlier. I mean, um, I sort of got a slide later on, but some of you are old enough to remember, uh, I think there was a 60s version and a 90s version of an old TV show called Supermarket Sweep. But that's what it's gonna be like. We're gonna have to run up and down the aisles and throw a bunch of things in our cart and maybe answer some trivia questions at the end of the game. But um, as I said, um, if we were to start today, we'd still be challenged to spend on average about $300,000 a week. We've also reviewed extensively uh, written Treasury Department guidance and frequently asked questions. These are documents that the Treasury Department has been building on and improving uh, since uh, late March or early April. And we've listened to at least two webinars multiple times with questions and an answer sessions that are hosted by who we, the fellow who we think is the guru for the Treasury Department on, on this particular act. I think his name is Daniel Kowalski. 
He's really an interesting guy to listen to. He kind of sounds like Anthony Fauci when he's talking. But he does know his stuff. And a lot of the questions and answers that we've heard on, on these webinars uh, really surprised us to the good as to how these funds um, can be used and how they can be useful in, in covering the fiscal gap I spoke of earlier. Um, I think in a previous email to you all, that our allotment is $7.6 million. And when we were sort of stumping this out a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ms. Diamond, Ms. Richland, Mr. Welch and myself, I think we determined, is this the right number, Amy, 9.2 million? if we just wanted to cover all of our uh, public safety payroll expenses. But I think we wanted to be a little bit more selective and try to follow some of the traits that um, other local governments were doing. We think what we earmarked, so to speak, or identified really, to try to cover uh, public safety payroll expenses is sufficient right now for fulfilling the, the fiscal gap. But we also know that funds are needed for public health precautions, not just for public facilities, but public facilities in high traffic areas. And we realize that our own um, local health department, particular, particularly with the testing site, they're gonna need some assistance too, but uh, like with everybody else that we may give outside assistance to, they can't duplicate or double, uh, double dip any other care's money that would otherwise be available to them. We got to use uh, they got to use it for another purpose, and I think the Treasury guidance even suggests that you can't supplant federal funds with federal funds. I'm actually going faster than I thought, Commissioner Russian. Um, as far as our safety net services. We felt like it's most beneficial to try to target low-income, disadvantaged, uh, unemployed in individuals and families. And uh, some of this assistance could include things like Meals on Wheels for seniors, food banks, maybe grants to uh, nonprofit agencies of, uh, of different kinds. It could be mental health, homeless, what, what have you. And I'm not talking about big grants. I mean, they may be more in the form of micro-grants, we haven't decided how we want to uh, structure the program yet, but depending upon how far or how broadly we want to try to distribute these funds, it, I'm guessing it, it could be anywhere from five to $25,000. And um, you all are familiar with ActionPAT, formerly called Concerted Services. I've had a discussion uh, with the executive director of ActionPAT if we were going to do something to help the most needy individuals or families, they've already got the so-called infrastructure in place to do that. They, they can qualify needs-based individuals or, or families much in screen, the screening applications or where, uh, where the dollars need to go much better than we can. And the CARES Act also allows us to pay them an administrative fee to help cover the work burden that they would have in helping us do more for people in Boa County. We're still evaluating some small business report, but I think the big issue is that I don't feel like we have an, an adequate agent locally or, or agency. And uh, I know things, uh, I, I know, for example, since Ms. Barr is here, that uh, the cities work with big on the program uh, that, that they have. But those are locally based funds and fundraising, and the CARES Act is a little bit different. And uh, we've noticed that when, when we looked at all these different local governments or researched all the different local governments, you know, if you do something for uh, particularly small business support, what you're really doing is uh, mimicking the payroll protection program. So that's a lot of screening, a lot of paperwork, you know. These things are going to be audited, and we we don't feel secure that we have an agent or the internal staff available to manage the business support program. Where on the other hand, if we work with Action Pack, where they're set up to do this kind of stuff um, with uh, nonprofits and, and other human services agencies, I think that's a little more ideal for us. And 
it ensures that it hits the people who need, who need this stuff the most. But again, I think the key, key qualifying uh, provisions are going to be that no other CARES Act funding is available and all the health or funds must be used for local needs only. Uh, in terms of reserve funds, current versus targeted estimates, uh, things like that, many communities hold back a certain amount of funds in the unforeseen event that there's another wave between now and December 30th. I know we seem like we're in our first wave really here, but we don't know how much to that uh, or how long that's going to last. So we targeted just under $400,000, I think, to keep, uh, keep in reserve. But if you go back to that rolling budget concept, we know that as we get our payroll expenses reimbursed, as the health department may have some needs, as we may do this nonprofit thing, uh, making building accommodations, we're trying to price everything we can. And that, that's the difference between an estimated budget right now and, and, and a target budget, because there's still about a million, a million dollar gap. Uh, we're still fervently trying to get a lot of pricing estimates for the things that are on our longer wish list. But as it comes to fruition, I think it'll work out okay, but it's not going to be the same kind of line, line item control that you're used to seeing in, um, in our ordinary budgets. We are going to set up a special revenue fund, and when necessary and appropriate, we'll make transfers back to the general fund, particularly to cover uh, the payroll expense reimbursements and uh, uh, maybe some of the other things with sanitation, PPE, um, building accommodations. We still have to work that out a little bit. Again, we're working on a cash flow sheet. But the main goal is, is that we don't want to leave any money on the table. If we're entitled to get $7.6 million, we should try to use every penny of it because every penny we don't use goes back to Treasury. So um, we thought very hard and carefully about how to uh, put, put these dollars to good use. And um, I, I think as we move forward and the portal opens up, um, I, I, I think by the time we're done on December 30th, provided COVID-19 hasn't just exploded to epic proportions, uh, I, I think we'll be in a better place. And we've also been in the same breath uh, to help the community. And this is uh, a snapshot of the CAD world get categorical budget and there you can see the differences between current estimates and target estimates you go down to the bottom you see that 1.1 uh, million dollar figure that uh, we have to close or at least get it down to approximately three hundred eighty three thousand dollars but uh, again we're working on that very aggressively and uh, the most important thing is I think we're prepared uh, when, when the portal does open up. The only thing we don't know is when that's going to happen. And we haven't been told yet by the state, we haven't been given any state guidance on how the three rounds or phases will work because it's all predicated on a model that was used in the state of Texas. GMA and ACCG wrote a joint letter to the governor that suggested these three phases. And it appears that he's willing uh, to follow or mimic that strategy, but we don't know when the availability of reimbursements will occur um, as far as phase two or phase three. But I think when phase one comes up, and you know, Andy, although I'm sure he's already thinking about it, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about cash flow this week, but it seems like we have time. But I think we'll probably go with um, Payroll expenses first, going back to March 1st, and I've kind of divided it by time periods, although my spreadsheet isn't done, and maybe we can pick up some PPE or sanitation supplies every block. And then we just wait on, that will be the basis for our cash flow so we can buy the other stuff, and then we'll get the next reimbursement in phase two. But we're, 
like that nice zigzag thing that I talked about. So again, we're waiting on the governor's office. Um, I think I just explained this slide uh, a moment ago. Uh, it's not a graphic or tabular data of, of the cash flow, but um, we, we've got to assume that by early or mid-October they'll release phase two, and then maybe phase three toward the end of the year. I want to take one minute and talk about our COVID-19 task force. You know, there are several several people in the recreation department, David Campbell and, and Ted Wins uh, and Cindy Malik have um, conferred with, with these folks too. They're working uh, very hard and actually the CARES Act money can, can play into this and, and vice versa. But with the pandemic the way it is locally and we, we have to develop policy with a theory and a plan of how we're going to handle keeping open or semi-open facilities based on the governor's executive order. I don't foresee a state shutdown again right now, but it's like I said to you, I think four to six weeks ago, if we're going to be open, we have to be open smart. So they're re-examining all of our protocols, policies, they're working on a communication plan, and then they're going to develop documentation of how we monitor progress and amend the protocols if necessary. They're going to be out visiting buildings, they're going to be talking to employees. Um, we have an employee survey that's going to go out this week. Uh, we we'll want to measure the sentiments and suggestions of employees in the workplace regarding COVID-19 and ask them what they think we need or tell us what we have that's good. Again, the facilities review, and we're hopefully targeting August of the meeting on August the 4th, where the task force will give a report. And then uh, Kimberly Sharp of Recreation, um, through her ordinary work, really, uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Cindy, but she's setting up a training program that she can, I believe, train either department heads, individual employees, or groups of employees whether it's how to use a mask, how to properly sanitize, and good hygiene practices, talk about different concerns that employees may have. And I think that'll be very instructive to uh, implementing the plan. So that's really about it. I almost had Mr. Rushing or Commissioner Rushing the whole time, but I guess I lost him on slide 18. But, uh, but having said all that, that, that does uh, conclude my presentation. And I've thrown a lot at you. It's, this stuff can be very, very confusing, but you know, if you're in, in the tre trenches with it, like we've been over the last few weeks, I think we've figured out a lot of the confusion. But uh, what we've tried to do is prepare our rolling budget if all of those funds become available. So any questions or comments of me? One statement that resonated in my mind that you made, do not leave any on the table. We hope not to. Uh, so, um, any commission comments? We do appreciate all the effort on this. And I was remiss. Andy, is there anything you want to add? You've got a lot of work on this. Is there something I'm going to add? Now, just want to comment. Commissioner Gibson earlier asked about the uh, census. This has everything to do with the census because those dollars are directly related to how many people live in Bullock County, whether it's in the city or in an unincorporated area. All of this money is predicated on the census, so it's important for us to get a good count this go around as well. Thank you. Any additional staff comments? Commissioner comments? I, for one, would like to thank security for being here this morning and, and the sheriff for allowing y'all to come. And uh, if there's no other comments, then I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion seconded for discussion. All those in favor of adjournment, show of hands. Unanimous approval. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you.